It would, it would when she started. Yeah. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This Sunday, the fourth Sunday in the season of Lent, we, we are making our way towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, which also means we are making our way towards Easter Sunday, the day of resurrection. This morning, we consider words from the Gospel of John, the third chapter, yes, the 16th verse, for God so loved the world. Let us prepare to hear words of comfort and praise, thanksgiving, words of hope from our scripture. Let us also recognize as we enter into worship that we are a called people. Oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever.
Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, you bring salvation to the world. Give us strength to believe in him, that we may share in his victory over the power of death and fulfill the purpose for which you have made us. For he dwells with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, for people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Let us uncover our sin before the liberating light of Christ in prayer. Merciful God, we confess the folly of our sin and the hypocrisy of our complaints. We grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources while hoarding earth's goods and cheating the poor. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not actively work to address them. Merciful God, expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin and free us from our foolish ways that we may know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Children of God, indeed we know that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I'm so glad to have this time with you today. So on this Sunday, one year ago, I gave my first children's message ever from up here at the lectern, because that was the first Sunday. There were no children here. You weren't here. And I had to talk to you through a camera. I'll tell you. It sure feels different, but while a lot of things are different, I appreciate more than ever what we've been able to keep the same. I still get to talk to you every week. We all still get together to worship every Sunday. We still get to hear the pastor's sermon. We have found ways to have the choir singing. 
and we get to hear Mrs. Cooper play so beautifully during worship. We have found a way for each of us up here to continue to do what we do, to use the gifts that God has given us, even when everything is different. But I gotta tell you, if there is one person up here whose skill I wish I had the ability to do, it would be Mrs. Cooper, hands down. Man, do I wish that I could play the organ and piano like she can. I took five years of piano as a kid, but these days I can barely pluck out Mary Had a Little Lamb. I have not retained any of those skills, so I absolutely appreciate getting to hear Mrs. Cooper play. I suppose it's human nature to compare ourselves to others. We may wish that we could be more like someone that we admire, someone who can play the piano, or is a good artist, or is good at sports, someone who knows all about computers. We may wish that we could run faster, be prettier, be smarter, funnier, the list goes on and on. It's not helpful, however, to compare yourselves to others. You will always find someone who can do certain things better than you, just as you can do certain things better than others. In Paul's letter uh, to the Ephesians, he says, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are created by God, each one of us special and unique. You have all you need to be who you are meant to be. That's really wonderful, isn't it? You don't need to compare yourself to others. God has given you all you need to be the very best you. This verse also teaches us that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. God has given you the brain and the heart to be able to make a difference in this world. God has a plan for each one of us. It is our job to use our talents to find our best life and to do what we were created for. And that's our good news for today. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making each one of us special and unique. Thank you for Jesus, who taught us how to do what we were created for. Help us to be our best selves so that we can make a difference in this world. Amen. Friends, as we turn to Holy Scripture, we ask for God to guide us. Let us go into prayer. Almighty God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, open your word and illumine our darkened world that we may see clearly and live faithfully by the light of your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Hebrew Scripture for today comes to us from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. The Lord responds to grumbling. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. 
The people spoke against God and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For out of, out of Egypt, for there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we prepare our hearts to listen to the epistle this morning, I will give a little tiny plug for later on. Because as I understand it, Pastor Dave will be preaching from John. But come this evening, uh, Pastor Ben and I will be trying something new and having a conversational sermon on this text, Ephesians chapter 2. So let us, for the first time today, listen to the words from Ephesians chapter 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness Toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Children of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Gospel reading from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. We begin at the 14th verse. Let us listen now to the Gospel of the Lord. Jesus speaks. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not come, or God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people preferred darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redemption. Amen. Well, a young man was drinking heavily and yet still decided to go for a swim at the beach. Fortunately, an older gentleman was watching the young man as he entered the water. When at one point the young man did not come back, up out of the water, the older man rushed in, saved his life. A few years later, that same young man was standing in court, facing a sentence of public intoxication. Suddenly, the young man realized the judge was the very man who saved his life when he was drowning years earlier. He looked at the judge and, and spoke up. Sir, sir, don't you recognize me? You saved my life. Do you remember? Well, the judge, the judge nodded his head and then looked at the young man and, and said, Young man, then I was your savior. Now I am your judge. For many, this sums up the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our, our Savior becomes the judge. We confidently turn to John chapter 3, verse 16, to prove the point. The story we read this morning rightly begins, I have to admit, at verse 1, not at verse 14. And, and to really know what is going on, we have to start there. We'll make it quick. A man by the name of Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, makes his way to Jesus. He does not come to criticize or to test or to judge Jesus. He comes because he has, he has perceived that Jesus is a teacher who has come from God. Nicodemus has discerned this much. No one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Nobody could be doing the things Jesus is doing apart from the presence of God. Jesus responds to Nicodemus with words that seem almost designed to create confusion or, or misunderstanding. What does he say? He says, verily, verily, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Needless to say, Nicodemus responds, as I assume most of us would have 
responded. How, how can anyone, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Well, Jesus is, of course, we know, not speaking of physical rebirth, but of spiritual rebirth. Jesus seems to be saying that this rebirth is both a working and a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's of God. It comes from above. Jesus then goes on to speak of the religious confusion that many, including the Jews, seemed to suffer. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? He then offers perhaps a way out of their confusion. He speaks of a testimony, a revelation. This testimony, this revelation will clear things up. He says, he says just as Moses Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, that may be as clear as mud to you and me, but what Jesus was saying was perfectly clear to those who were listening to him at the time. Jesus speaks of the story. He alludes to the story we read this morning from Numbers, the, the 21st chapter. We find the Israelites in the, in the middle of their wilderness wandering. The, the food supply is meager and the quality is less than satisfying. And the people grow impatient. They complain among themselves. God does not take kindly to their complaining or their lack of gratitude. So he, he sends deadly poisonous snakes to infest the people. The people recognize their sin, their ingratitude, and, and confess their sin to Moses. Moses pleads their case to God, and God responds, telling Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses does as he's instructed. He made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. So when we return to that third chapter in John, and we hear Jesus saying, And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What can we conclude? We can conclude that Jesus is the one to help unravel our religious confusions. Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He's telling those who are around them. He's telling you and me. Telling you and me that, that religious confusion turns to understanding as you look up at Jesus on the cross. In fact... In fact, to, to listen to, to watch, to be present to Jesus throughout his ministry is to have God revealed to you perfectly clearly. Watch, listen, and learn, we might say. As the old hymn suggests, keep your eyes upon Jesus. Now, Jesus utters those words often described as the gospel of Jesus Christ in a single sentence. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. The love of God, we are told, is infinite. It is not confined to, to one people or to one time or one, to one place. It is not given for one nation. It is given to all without distinction or exception. Noted 20th century New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce puts it this way, the love of God is limitless. It embraces all of humankind. No sacrifice was too great to bring its unmeasured intensity home to men and to women. 
The best that God had to give, God gave. His only son, his well-beloved. Yes, the gospel in, in one sentence. Could it be? <laughs> Friends, really now. Could the gospel of Jesus Christ really be summed up in one sentence? No. Of course not. It takes two. And a third to help clarify the second. Listen again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Clarification. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Unfortunately, the 16th verse is not enough. We have to add verses 17 and, yes, 18 for, for one reason and one reason alone. We simply are not satisfied with verse 16 as it stands alone. We've read enough Holy Scripture, both the Hebrew Scripture and, and the New Testament, to know that there simply must be additional words spoken. Words about judgment and words about condemnation. You have to. So John goes on to fill our need, but in ways that will most likely surprise us and, and maybe even offend some of us about judgment. That's a hard one. It's difficult because Jesus challenges that traditional understanding of judgment. Most of us have formed our opinion on God's judgment through the passages of the Hebrew scriptures where we are inclined to, to view God's actions of judgment through the lens of punishment. I would suggest they are better understood through the lens of love, but that's another sermon. In verse 17, John presents us with what is perhaps a new idea. Here he tells us that God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Then John appears to contradict himself in the very next verse by saying, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Huh? Are we judged or are we judged not? Confused? Let me suggest this. What John is describing here is not a judgment that is brought down upon you by God. Rather, John is talking about a judgment we bring upon ourselves. John is presenting Jesus as a gift offered to you and to me. We understand the gift offered through Jesus is the gift of life and salvation. Present tense, by the way. Life now and life eternal, life beyond death. Accept the gift and accept life and life everlasting. Refuse the gift and, well, you don't get the gift. Again, F.F. F. Bruce suggests that it is not God who judges us. Rather, we convict ourselves. He writes, The separation between those who accept God's forgiveness and those who refuse it is inevitable. But the latter are self-judged. The responsibility for their self-judgment cannot be laid at the door of the Savior of the world. He came, to, he came so that those who believe in him should not perish. How can those who reject his gift of life do other than perish? That's judgment. In John, we are not judged. Rather, we judge ourselves. Now, what about the other word, that word, condemnation? The consequence of judgment we render unto ourselves. The Jesus presented in, in the Gospel of, of John is very dualistic. By that I mean Jesus often presents the world, reality, 
as consisting of two basic yet opposed or opposite principles. There is darkness and there is light. There is goodness and there is evil. There is spirit and there is flesh. There is belief and there is disbelief. There is life and there is death. In the Gospel of John, those who live in the light, live in the spirit, practice the good, trust in Jesus, they have life. And they will have life eternal. Those who live in darkness, who live in the flesh, practice evil, do not trust Jesus, they perish. They die. They cease to exist. The Greek word is opalami. And it means to destroy or abolish, to put an end to, to render useless, to die. In John, there is no hell to contemplate, no threat of eternal damnation, no continuous pain or suffering. There is no season of purging or re-education we might call purgatory. There is only life or death. There is only life everlasting or death. When we properly understand the third chapter of the Gospel of John, and especially the 16th verse, the work of Jesus, the proper work of God, as one author puts it, becomes very clear. It is radically redefined, this proper work of God, from even current popular understanding the trick for us is to take the words of John 3.16 at face value and to trust them without reserve. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. In fact, they are the only words needed to speak the gospel truth, the proper work of God, the proper work of God, according to John, is salvation. It is salvation, not damnation. It is life. It is not death. It is light. It is not darkness. God is not our Savior one day and our judge the next. The proper work of God is to save the world, not to condemn it. It is to give the world life, not death. It is to illumine the truth, not obscure or hide it. And all of this because God so loves. This is how God loves us. This is the good news of the gospel. This is news that is not hard to proclaim nor is it a threat or an accusation. It is simply good news. God as Savior. God who acts out of love, not to condemn the world, but to save it. To save it. Thanks be to God, who in Christ brings life. Amen. Friends, indeed, the word has been read, the word proclaimed, and now is our time to respond to the word. This morning we do so with the Apostles' Creed. So let us together confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, we give you thanks for your simple, pure, authentic love as it has been made known to us in Jesus Christ. You have made us, Lord, or so it seems to question and to confuse how often we make things more difficult than they need to be. And so this morning we give you thanks for the Gospel of John and for the words of Jesus that lay things out so completely for us, simply, only the basics. You came in the world to rescue sinners, to bring salvation, to bring life and light. You offer us that through Jesus Christ. And so how can we do anything other than praise you, to worship you? adore you and to lift you before all the world that they too may see your glory, your wonder, your perfection all borne out through love. Lord, make us instruments of your grace, your peace, all that come to us through the good news of your love. Allow the words we speak, the things we do, each in their own way to, to proclaim you, to announce your glory, and to announce your good news, your invitation. Grant, lad, Lord, that your, your church throughout all creation may continue to share this message, this good news. Continue to give us clarity that this news is for all the world. Those who we might choose to exclude are not excluded. On the contrary, you send us quite deliberately amongst the least, the lost, and the alone. The ones who suffer injustice, the ones who hunger and thirst in body or mind or spirit, those who must endure violence, warfare, those who have no place to lay their head or rest their spirit. Lord, indeed, send us out. Bless us for that task, for that calling. And again, this, that you might be glorified, honored, and praised. This, that the good news of the gospel, the excellent good news of the gospel, may be shared into all places, even into the darkness. Finally, we pray, Lord, that you will hear our voices as we lift to you the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We are the body of Christ, Christ Presbyterian Church. God has called us to the city center of Canton that here we may be about the ministry of Jesus Christ here and beyond. We acknowledge that our life together, the things we do together, the ministry we invoke, the things we study, the things we do, they speak of the kingdom of God. So we take time every week to consider the calendar. Um, a couple things to be mindful of. Two weeks from this evening, a uh, concert series presentation of Benjamin Britten's Abraham and Isaac. Michael, I'm going to give this a shot. Listen as Sarah Pazderek Sevenry <laughs> and Michael Wallace, um, Alto, and tenor uh, offer this as a gift to us in this season of Lent. That is broadcast on Sunday, March 28th, for class Facebook and YouTube. Uh, it will be streamed. Um, week after that is Holy Week. Specifically, now we think about the Easter egg hunt. It starts at noon. If you have children, grandchildren, bring the neighbor's kids. Bring them to Christ Church at noon. We won't be doing the brunch as usual, but um, there'll be a short message for the kids, and then the hunt will begin. So prepare for that. As Michael mentioned earlier, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, a, a gathered worship here in the sanctuary. If you would like to come, we do ask you to register ahead of time uh, you can do that by going to the church website and following the instructions there, and we will get you signed up and have a place reserved for you. And as Michael mentioned, um, there will be a, a brief meditation, but it will be more of a discussion on the piece from Ephesians, a discussion between Michael and Ben. It's a prayer service, and, and it is a quiet thing and a thoughtful thing, and, and it is good for this season. Um, please pay attention to your, the order of worship and the, the various notes, including the plans for Holy Week and the Day of Resurrection Easter morning. Um, there's lots of opportunity. We're opening up for people there to be together. Finally, this afternoon, we will um, celebrate and, and give thanks to God. Our, you know, our senior highs, our youth groups have been have meeting throughout the covid uh, they meet again this afternoon at 4 o'clock. They meet on Zoom, um, on computer screen, something they're very comfortable doing. Uh, they will do that today as well. I'd encourage you to read all the, the announcements uh, in the order of worship. Uh, keep your calendar handy. Plan to participate, as I say, over and over again as you are prepared, as you are able to do. Finally, again, um, a thank you. A uh, personal thank you from me, from, from the staff of the church, uh, from the session. You, as a congregation, have been faithful in your giving. Uh, and that has allowed us to continue the ministry throughout this last past year and, and to do it well, uh, to do it completely. We have not had to cut out anything that, that might have had to have been cut out because of uh, COVID. I'm grateful. We are grateful. And it is a, a sign unto God. It is a, a blessing that I'm very sure God sees and understands as the activity of a faithful people. So again, thank you for that. Every week we still dedicate our lives and our gifts to God's purpose. Let us join together in the prayer of dedication. Merciful God, we thank you for your wonderful works among humankind. Accept this offering with the dedication of our lives and help us to be for the world an emblem of your steadfast love in Jesus Christ. Amen.
friends, we go into the world to celebrate a God who so loves the world that he brings among us salvation, truth, light as an offering of his very self to us. Thanks be to God. Let us go. In the name of the Father and the Son, let us go. Amen.